Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is verse 35 in chapter two of Hatha Yoga Pradipika. Ta da! <laughs> Perform exhalation and inhalation rapidly like the bellows of a blacksmith. This is called Kapalabhati and it destroys all mucus disorders. The last of the six Shatkarma is Kapalabhati. In Garanda Samhita, it is known as Halabhati. Uh, Hala, Halabhati. Bala and Kapal mean the cranium or forehead. Bhati is light or splendor but it also means perception and knowledge. Kapalabhati is a pramayama technique which invigorates the entire brain and awakens the dormant centers which are responsible for subtle perception. In English, it is called the frontal brain cleansing technique. It is a similar practice to astrika pranayama, except that exhalation is emphasized and inhalation is the result of forcing the air out. In normal breathing, inhalation is active and exhalation is passive. This practice reverses that process so that exhalation becomes active and inhalation passive. As described in the sloka, the breathing should be done like the pumping action of a pair of blacksmith's bellows. When the bellows are closed, the air is pushed out and when they are open, the air is sucked in due to the vacuum effect that is created. Similarly, when you inhale in Kapalabhati, it should be the reaction to the forced exhalation. In Astrika, inhalation and exhalation are equal, but in Kapalabhati, it is not so. According to the Garanda Samhita, there are three forms of Kapalabhati, Vadakrama, Vudkrama, and Shitkrama. Hatha Yoga Pradikika describes only Vadakrama. Vada means wind or air. Okay, um, I think I'm going to skip reading the directions. Or maybe, Pam, should I read the directions? Um, that's up to you. I read them yesterday from the Wally breathing. I okay, so it's a little different because with um, the, the asanas, especially the ones she was describing, I think. Um, they were hard for us to visualize, but maybe for the breathing, they're not as challenging. Okay, so I will read them. Technique one, Vada Krama Kapalabhati, air cleansing. Sit in a comfortable meditative pose, preferably Siddhasana, Siddha Yonayasana, and prepare yourself as for meditation. Close the eyes and relax, keeping the spine erect. Place the hands in either Jnana or Chin Mudra. Practice Kaya, Siddharium, that is steadiness of body. Inhale deeply and perform 50 fast respirations through both nostrils, placing more emphasis on exhalation. Inhalation should be short. After the last exhalation, inhale deeply through the nose and exhale quickly through the mouth, slightly pursing the lips. With Kumbhakta, perform Jalandahara Banda, Mula Banda, and Uddiyana Banda in this order, but almost simultaneously. Wow. <laughs> Maintain. Hey, you, want to, you want me to pause there? <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Kumbhaka is the retention of the breath. So let's say pause. So they're saying after we do the bellows breath, which is this um, idea of using the stomach to exhale, the right. inhale hap happens naturally. And then after you do, I, Amanda sometimes has us do like 30 rounds on, on the sadhana. And then after you exhale completely, you take a deep breath in and you pause. And here, um, this slight pause is Kumbhaka. The Jalahanda Fonda is the throat lock. The Mula Banda is the root lock and Uddiyanda Banda is the stomach lock. So you're, what you're trying to do is this idea of holding prana in. We're taking a full inhale and we're locking the breath in at the top and the bottom and then in the um, stomach area. Okay. And that's not something you would practice as a beginner. That's something you would practice under your teacher's guidance. 
when they say they feel you're ready, I guess. Okay. Maintain Kumbhaka and the bandhas for as long as possible and count the duration. Before inhaling, release Mula Bandha, Uddiyana, and Jalahara in this order. When, so in other words, reverse, right? Yeah, so once you're done, once you're ready to exhale, you release the root, the stomach. So you're going up. You're releasing the root, the stomach, yeah. and the throat. Yeah, that's that's almost like a natural thing to happen, actually. Yeah. Because I've done this before, and and at this point, that it it's if you can get the bandas in order, that is, I didn't realize what this was, but at this point, if you get the bandas in order, it's almost like a natural release. So. Yeah. When the head is raised, inhale slowly through the nose. Practice three rounds of 50 breaths. And what you said about not doing it as a beginner and doing it with a teacher is really true because you can make yourself so lightheaded you pass out if you do this on your own. When this is perfected, you can increase it to five rounds. You can increase the practice by 10 breaths each week so that after five weeks, you are practicing 100 breaths per round. After completing the practice, concentrate on the space in front of the closed eyes. And kap, kapal, kapal body, kapal body, a greater number of respirations can be taken than in Vastrika Pranayama because hyperventilation does not occur. And that has sort of not been my experience, but it can be decreased to 200 breaths or I'm sorry, it can be increased to 200 breaths with months of practice unless advised otherwise by your guru. The palabadi should be done after asana or neti, but before concentration or meditation. If you experience dizziness while practicing, it means you're breathing too forcefully. If this is the case, stop the practice, sit quietly for a few moments. When you begin the practice again, do it with more awareness and with less force. Inhalation should be spontaneous and not controlled. Exhalation should not make you feel breathless before completing the round. This is important. You should feel as if you could continue breathing in this manner beyond 100 breaths. The effects of Kapalabhati and Vastrika are similar, but due to the forced and longer exhalation, Kapalabhati affects the brain differently. Andre van Lysbeth has quoted a physiological phenomena that during normal inhalation, the fluid around the brain is compressed. And so the brain contracts very slightly. With exhalation, this cerebrospinal fluid is decompressed and the brain is very, very slightly expands. This is the mechanical influence of the respiratory cycle on the structure of the brain. Forced exhalation in Kapalabhati increases the massaging effect on the brain by enhancing decompression effect on every exhalation. The average number of breaths being 15 per minute means the brain is compressed and decompressed that many times. But here you are breathing 50 to 100 times, stimulating the brain three to seven times more than normal per round. Kapalabhati also expels more carbon dioxide and other waste gases from the cells and lungs than normal breathing. In the Garhanda Samhita, the method of practicing Vatakama Kapalabhati is slightly different. Instead of breathing in rapidly through both nostrils, you inhale through the left, exhale through the right, inhale through the right, and exhale through the left, as in Nadi Shodhana Pranayama, except that inhalation and exhalation is done rapidly. The Hatha Ratnatvali clarifies these two different processes. It says, fast rotation of the breath from left to right, right to left, or exhalation and inhalation through both nostrils together is known as Kapalabhati. Thus, the two systems are correct. However, to accel accelerate the breath while doing alternate nostril breathing is very difficult. Technique two, sinus cleaning, Vahut Krama Kapalabhati. The second practice of Kapalabhati, Vahut Krama, is similar to Jala Neti and is sometimes given as a part of Neti. But Vahut Kurama means expelling system. For this practice, you need a bowl of warm saline water rather than a Neti Lota. Lean forward, scoop the water up in the palm of the hand, sniff the water in through the nostrils. 
Let the water flow down into the mouth, spit the water out from the mouth. Practice in this way several times. It's important to relax while sucking the water in. There should be absolutely no fear. If there is pain in the nose during the practice, it usually means the water contains either too little or too much salt. Technique three, Shikrama Kapalabhati, mucus cleansing. The third practice, Shikrama is the reverse of Vyutkrama. Sheet means cool or passive. In this practice, if you take a mouthful of warm, salty water, and instead of swallowing it, you push it up through the nose and let it flow out. Remember to remain relaxed the whole time. Vyut Krama and Sheet Krama should both be done standing rather than squatting. Afterwards, make sure all the water is removed from the nose in the same way prescribed for Jala Neti, or practice Vada Krama Kapalabhati. The Garhanda Samhita says that not only do these practices rid the sinuses of old mucus, but they make one attractive and prevent the aging process from occurring. Kapalabhati helps relax facial, mus facial muscles and nerves. It rejuvenates tired cells and nerves, keeping the face young, shining, and wrinkle-free. The effects of the hut krama and sheet krama are the same as jalaneti. Spiritually, they help awaken anja chakra. So jalaneti she spoke about in what we spoke about last week. Um, and the ajna chakra is the third eye chakra. Right. Okay. Should I move on? Yeah. Okay, so verse 36, also chapter 2. By the six karmas, shot karma, one is freed from excesses of the doshas. Then pranayama is practiced and success is achieved without strain. If the body is clogged with old mucus, bile, and wind, the energy gained through pranayama practice will be utilized for rectifying your disorders. In fact, if you have any mucus blockages, it may create an acute problem that you cannot practice pranayama. First, you have to rid yourself of excess mucus and bile and eliminate the toxins from your systems. Proper assimilation and excretion have to be established. Pranayama is more effective in a healthy body. The body has three faults, kapha, mucus, pita, pitta, acid, and vata, wind. An imbalance in these causes disease. In the same way, the mind has three faults. The first is mala, impurity. The second is dikshepa, distraction. And the third is avarna, ignorance. Impurity is the psychological stuff which manifests when you sit for meditation. There are five types. Kama, sensual desire. Krodha, anger. Moha, infatuation. Mata, arrogance or pride. Matsarya, envy. When visions float across your mind and the mind cannot be made steady because it keeps oscillating, that is vikshipa. When the mind is unable to understand itself, it is called ignorance or avarna. Through the practice of shat karma, the centers in the physical body, which are responsible for arousing these doshas in the mind, are stabilized. Shat karma works on the physical body to influence the mind, brain waves, and blockages of energy. Verse 37. According to some teachers, pranayama alone removes impurities, and therefore they hold pranayama in esteem and not the other techniques. Here, Yogi Shwat Marama points out that there are two differing opinions about the necessity of practicing the Shat Karma prior to Pranayama. Some Hatha Yoga teachers say you should first clean the nadis through Shat Karma, so Pranayamas will be effective. Others believe Pranayama alone will remove the blockages in the nadis and balance all elements of the body. Both opinions are correct, but which to follow? Shat karma provides a quick method of rebalancing mucus, bile, and wind. If you cleanse the body through shat karma first, pranayama will maintain its state of cleanliness. If you have excess mucus, bile, or wind, and practice pranayama only, 
The energy you generate through pranayama will all be spent in rectifying your state of imbalance. However, if your body is healthy, nadis clean, and the whole system is functioning in harmony, then pranayama can be practiced without any need for shakama. If there is a slight imbalance, pranayama alone will be sufficient to rectify any problem. Excess mucus is the major obstacle which prevents pranayama practice. When the nose or respiratory tract is completely blocked, pranayama is impossible. So you will definitely have to resort to neti, kunjal, or even laghu shankha prak shalana. For nasal, for nasal, nasal, I'm sorry, for nasal <laughs> congestion, neti and kunjal are sufficient. But for respiratory congestion, asthma, bronchitis, or eosinophilia, the three karmas will be necessary. Although the shock karma are very powerful and effective purifier and harmonizers, pranayama will have to be practiced afterwards to maintain the balance they have created. Otherwise, impurities will reaccumulate and the body will fall back into its old patterns. So I, I want to stop because I, I it, 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 it dawns on me again in reading this for myself as a student, and maybe for a, a lot of students. It makes it clearer than ever why you need um, a, a knowledgeable, experienced teacher to proceed along this. Um, and the teacher has to know who you are and has to know a fair amount about, about you and about your body in order to determine um, which route to follow or, or which it seems to me there could be a hybrid as well and, and whether or not that would be useful. So I don't know, Pam, you, you have a lot more experience with these approaches than I do. I don't know if that's uh, your take on it. I 100% agree with you on the first part of that sentence, as far as, yes, the teacher needs to build relationships with the students. And um, as far as having more experience, I don't think I have more experience. And so I, I studied my yoga teacher training in 2017, and it's a 200 hour program. And Amanda's program is phenomenal. But it's also, I could have just taken that 200 hour and been like, okay, I'm a yoga teacher and then just kept showing up in the studio. But I feel like it, it has to be, it, and, I, and I have this written in, in my notes, like it, it is a lifetime journey to be a yeah. teacher and a student. And we mm -hmm. all have that role. Like you are your own teacher. So I think it's, I think, when a st I think part of the yoga practice as a student for myself included, I think taking that teacher training obviously was more for me than it was for anybody else. And I love teaching yoga, but do I teach this breath work to students? No, because I'm not comfortable with it myself. And I, I'll teach alternate nostril breathing and ujjayi breath and nostril breathing, yeah. which I consider all breath breath work but would I teach a Kapalabhati no because and even like you saw me teach bumblebee breath the other day Sue for the first time like until I'm 100% comfortable and knowledgeable with it I would never put a student at risk just to look cool or fake as a yoga teacher um, well, and that's yeah, no question you're really you're you're very uh, cautious about this and you're very concerned about the integrity of your practice in terms of really knowing what you're doing, you know, the integrity of your teaching, especially. And that's why I keep up with this practice and I, I read books. I, but I, you know, like I've told you guys, I went too crazy absorbing information and I slow it down. Like it's okay that we're reading this book slowly and having these discussions. It doesn't have to be read in one week or one month. It, it can be done over a period of time, even if it takes us over a year, you know, like there's no time limit. I'd rather go slow and study and learn. And, and then what I'll say to that is if something's not 
and we spoke about this even in the sutras, Sue, but like if something doesn't make sense and something interests you, that's your cue to dive deeper into it. Ask a teacher, ask Amanda, ask the students, find articles online, find teachers you trust that can guide you into learning more about something. Um, yeah, and I, I do find this, this idea of um, question almost like questioning everything it's like why are we doing like why if you show up to a yoga class and you practice with the teacher regularly i'm not talking like a once in a while pop in or like there's a random sub but if it's somebody you practice with be like why are we why do we practice this you know and and they might have more information on it just because like we're learning so much as to reasons why these are so beneficial, these um, yoga teachers could help um, guide you to books where you can learn more on it. This way you can develop your own practice more. Right, <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. Or even like you were saying, Sue, like sometimes you feel, did you say you feel lightheaded or what did you say you get when well, when I, that, um, that uh, rapid uh, exhalation and then it results in inhalation, uh, um, yes, I would feel uh, lightheaded um, after doing it. And I was doing it with an experienced teacher and I had done a fair amount of, you know, some of the more basic pranayamas that, that you were talking about, Pam. I had, I had done those and, and, and I'm very comfortable with those. Uh, but <clears throat> that um, that made me uh, Kapalabhati uh, made did make me lightheaded at times. So yeah, so I think it's not a matter like students will come up to me after class sometimes and be like, "Why is this? Why is this?" I'm like, "Or why? Why is this hurting?" I'm like, "I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know. Like, this is the first time I've ever seen you. This is the first time you're ever practicing with me. I don't have the answers for you." But I think noticing that that breath does that for you, Sue. So then you know, like, okay, I'm not going to practice this. When the teacher says that we're going to do Kapalabhati, then I know. Or it it just allows you to witness what's going on and be present, and allows you to figure either figure out why or know that that practice isn't for you well the good news was it was just me and a couple of other people and uh the teacher had said ahead of time and they, you know they were you know experienced yoga practitioners and and she knew that they understood prani, pranayama at least at a basic level so the good news is she prefaced it by saying if you feel lightheaded stop and just breathe in and out you know get your breathing back together um, and basically gave the same recommendation that, that this author uh, provided, which is don't worry about doing it so forcefully. Think about what you're doing it, uh, about what you're doing it. It's just like any, uh, a yoga pose. You're not worried about looking pretty. You're worried about, are you doing the, the pose with the correct form that's suitable as, for your body? Yes. And, the same thing is true for this breathing. Um, so, you know, apparently I was doing it and I could tell I was doing this way too dramatically, you know, like, <laughs> you know, this is like uh, a movie with a lot of ships blowing up and cars crashing, you know, and, and it's, and, and the idea is no, you got to think about it. And it's the action of expelling air and then relaxing and letting the air flow back in. And I was able to get there just by basically slowing it down and thinking about it and then speeding it up a little bit. No way could I have done 50 rounds though. I think I was, I think we were at like 30 rounds or something like that. I was just gonna say though, even knowing where you are, if the teacher says we're doing 30 rounds and you wanna do 10 rounds, yeah. you know, that's fine. Hi, Amanda. Amanda just joined. Hey, hi. Hi. Hi, Amanda. You read about Kapalabhati breath today, so we're just discussing it. Yeah, I hear you, Sue. Yeah. 
the other thing too, and I've said this before too, like as a teacher, I feel like if I don't practice physical asana that week and I go and teach, then I feel like fraud. So like I wouldn't, I don't practice this breath regularly on my own. So it wouldn't be something until I started doing that in my own practice that I would. Yes, yeah, sure. So um, this the sequence of what happens first. Now, I, what, what did she say about the sequence? Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about the sequence of Kapala body itself, but it's the sequence of um, uh, asana uh, in reference to Kapala body. Do you do asana first or do you do Kapala body first? I think she said you do asana first and then you do Kapala body and then you do um, the meditation or concentration practice. Okay, thank you. I guess that makes sense because when when you're doing the asanas, that really helps to focus you, and it and it helps to loosen you up, and it gives you for me it gives me more. By the end of yoga, I feel like I have more comfort in my body and control of my body. Yeah, it's here on two twenty one. She says Kapalabhati should be done after asana or neti, but before concentration or meditation. Okay. Huh. She keeps and 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 Pam. Is it your impression? Because um, even though I took some notes, I don't have notes about this. Is it your impression that she's and it, it's my impression that she's saying you always begin in asana. You always begin in asana and then you can move forward to these other steps. Is that, am I remembering this correctly? I don't know specifically for this book and I've practiced both ways where I, when I first started practicing, we did pranayama first and then asana, but I feel like in Amanda's teacher training, I asked the same question, when do you do it? And it's sort of like you just, you have to get to notice uh, to, to, know the students i guess or whatever you feel comfortable but i feel like amanda has shared that pranayama makes students like i don't want to say like spacey but like it like makes you feel like um not as focused so she i think it's like you sort of lose the students after pranayama so it's like you do the asana first let them be present and focus on the asana and then move them into breath work and then or you can even do breath work i think i was confused do you do breath work like before savasana or after savasana so you do the asana first then the breath work and then they can meditate or they can do the savasana I think for my own practice, I like movement first. It's hard for me to just walk in the doors and want to just sit. And I think that's hard for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Like we want to come in and, and move. That makes sense to me. Um, and, and for me, especially because it's easier for me to sit and, you know, with the spine straight and, and feeling comfortable in that posture. After I do an asana practice, it doesn't have to be hyper long, but it's gotta be, I do an asana practice and then, then, the, then the breath work. And it's very interesting. I was thinking way back to when uh, Kali was leading, Kali was, our Kali was leading morning meditation. And she always began, we didn't begin with asana. She began with the, uh, Kirtan, call and response and, and chanting. And if that uh, isn't breath work, I don't know what is. And, uh, and then we would move into meditation. And sorry. <laughs> Today, I guess I'm on the flight path. <laughs> um, and, and so that was basically breath work before meditation too. 
wouldn't have hurt me, I'll tell you, walking in there and beginning doing this at 7.30 in the morning um, to sit up straight so that you can do, the, you know, the kirtan and then the meditation. I probably would have appreciated a few down dogs and child's poses and so on and so forth, you know, and maybe a twist or two. Yeah. So I, you know, I keep on going back to you know, I just have to get my act together before sitting down in this group. I've got to start doing a, sh a short little asana routine. Because I, I think it's, it would be very helpful. I, and I have to I have to do that. It would just mean kicking out the jams and getting off my tush by 7 a.m., you know, or 7.05. And it would also mean doing yoga, doing asana more frequently, which can only be good. Yeah. All right. I wrote my prescription. Now I have to do it. <laughs> I, I haven't moved since last week. I didn't practice. Um, I didn't take any classes all weekend or yesterday. But I just keep telling myself, well, at least I'm doing this part of yoga, this mental part of yoga, but it has to be a balance. It has to, can't just be this. You have to move too. For, well, at least for me. Pam, I couldn't agree with you more. For me, I have the same experience. And while I did a fair amount of physical activity over the weekend, none of it, no, that's not true. I did a yoga practice on Saturday with a group of people. So I did it on Saturday, but you know, it's been two days and I can feel it in my back and in my, in my body already. So, all right, that's it. I'm going to start doing at least a few warm up things prior to coming to this group tomorrow. I am making a commitment like Pam, you make those commitments and you hold them. You are my guiding light. Yeah. yeah as long as you plank every day. <laughs> plank every day yes i know I, you are the plank queen yeah i just have to keep planking but honestly planking is like for me a form of meditation and it it, it can be a form of breath like equal breath in equal breath out it's just a matter of being present for a minute or five minutes whatever you want to plank for every day it's not so much about planking you know um don't laugh but with this exercise physiologist we we often end sessions planking. And I agree with you because the only way I can get through planking without my brain yelling at me at the end is to breathe really slowly and count really slowly and just focus on breathing and, and, uh, which is a form of yoga for me when I'm doing <laughs> planking and he'll get, you know, we'll get up to, you know, 90 seconds or 120 seconds and, and, He'll say, Sue, how high did you count? And I'll say 36, you know, <laughs> but it works. Yeah. Right. So last night I started a book um, in the Bhakti tradition and in the book, he was saying that what you lead with, what you focus with has a lot to do with what tradition you're following. So the bhakti is like, Kali used to teach the class, we would call it bhakti flow because it was based on the bhakti tradition. Right. And in bhakti, you lead with your meditation and mantra practice. And um, in the jnana tradition, which is kind of what I taught you guys in teacher training, Pam, you lead with yama, niyama, um, asana, pranayama, right? There's the list. And that's the same with the royal yoga. But with hatha, it's more of like the materialist version of yoga. So you lead with, with asana. Remember, they kind of like omit the beginning, remember? You don't learn that till later. So sorry, I was wrangling a child to be able to talk to you. <laughs> That's what I had to say about what you were saying before, so yeah, no, that's helpful for me. Um, I was gonna move us into breath, but if anyone else wants to share anything, okay. so we'll set up for alternate nostril breathing. I'm not sure if we want to do a few rounds of Kapalabhati breath. I don't know if you're into it right now or if, um, like I said, I don't really teach it because I have to keep practicing. 
maybe as these months go by, or maybe we, Amanda leads, Amanda sometimes teaches that. So maybe when she reads, she can lead us through a few rounds of it. Um, so sitting up nice and tall, just breathing in and out through the nose. Maybe you just play with closing one nostril and then the other just to notice what's going on in both nostrils. And if one feels clogged, hold the opposite one for a little while. Just taking a few breaths to clear out the opposite nostril. Maybe you're feeling a little congested this morning, you could grab a tissue, clear it out. Then beginning to breathe through both nostrils. See if you can match the inhale to the exhale. So breathing in for three or four counts and then breathing out for three or four counts. Breathing deeply into the low belly, expanding belly button out. And then exhaling all the air out. And if you're new to this, and you just wanna play around with feeling what the locks feel like, the root lock, the belly lock, the throat lock, you don't have to hold the breath for too long, but you can just play with working with the muscles in those areas. They're hard to, hard to explain. Once you start experiencing them, you'll understand more about the locks. So the root lock, you'll pull up on the pelvic floor. It's almost, it's like the muscle, if you're peeing and you wanna stop the flow. And the belly lock is about two inches above the belly button pulling that area in and up under the ribs. And the throat lock, I took my chin down to my chest. You don't have to lock all three at once. You can just play with engaging one or the other. And these locks you can use throughout the yoga classes too and play with holding the root lock, the Uddiyana Bandha lock, the stomach lock. The stomach lock for me though, it gets tricky. It's important not to keep it engaged, like you're sucking in the belly for a, a picture. You gotta let the belly come out as you inhale and get that full breath in. It's a, tr it's a tricky area. We'll set up for a few rounds of alternate nostril breathing, bringing your right hand over your face. Closing right nostril with right thumb, inhale through your left. Close left with right right finger, exhale through right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. That was one full round, inhaling left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Inhale right, I mean inhale left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Taking five more rounds on your own breath. Adding the locks if they're in your practice.
Now take your time to finish exhaling out through the left nostril. There's no rush. I'm gonna go ahead and set the timer to start our 20 minutes.
bringing hands together in front of your heart. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much, Nikki. And thank you, Sue, for reading today. Thank you both. <laughs> See you both tomorrow. Yep. Have See a you great tomorrow. Day, guys. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, guys. Bye-bye.